Hi, good evening. Um, uh, welcome everybody to another OrthoHub webinar. Uh, my name is Ramon Tamasabi, I'm one of the OrthoHub team. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all back. Uh, we had a little bit of a break over the Christmas period. We've had one or two webinars already this year. And uh, tonight is particularly uh, close to my heart as a hand surgeon. We're talking about distal radius fractures. Uh, and we have a fantastic panel that we've put together uh, to help us uh, through this evening. Before we start, I'm just going to do one or two little bits of housekeeping. Um, the first is to say that we've got some amazing content coming up over the next few weeks. There's an ST3 preparation session that's going to be uh, coming up on the 8th of March. Just one night afterwards on the 9th, our old buddy uh, Alex Vriss is going to be um, talking about distal tibial pilon fractures on our series of what we call orthopedic decision making videos. We're going to release that and he'll be talking through some of the rationale, intraoperative, perioperative decision making regarding how we approach these difficult problems. For those of you that haven't uh, had a chance yet, there have been two really outstanding podcast releases. Uh, the first of which was uh, with Sui Ang, who is an orthopedic surgeon, another hand surgeon, uh, actually, but a humanitarian, an activist, and an author who has had an incredible life. That's on a podcast and also a video podcast that you can watch on YouTube or our channel. Andy Williams is a really well-known surgeon across uh, the UK and beyond. His podcast was outstanding, and actually he has filmed for us a How I Examine the Knee session. So the Andy Williams knee examination is also going to be coming up imminently. Then again, along the lines of hand surgery, we have in March uh, an upcoming webinar with Professor Joe Diaz talking about scaphoid fractures. And again, we'll be joined on that night by another one of my good friends, Nick Riley, who will be one of the other speakers from Oxford. Moving forward to tonight's webinar, the uh, first thing that I'd like to say is a big thank you to our sponsors for the evening who are Acumed. Um, these webinars remain free for anyone who wants to watch them and you know they're very freely accessible and in order to keep it free uh, for you guys we just cover our costs through generous sponsorship so thank you to the Acumed team. Tonight's host is Zaf Nakwi and for those of you who are involved in hand surgery you will already be very familiar with with Zaf's name and who he is. Um, he is a consultant hand surgeon who works at Salford uh, but he's probably best known for his contributions to the British Hand Society and for the Federation of European Societies of the Hand, FESH, uh, of which he is a council member for both organisations. He is an examiner for both British and European hand diplomas. Um, he is a very active and well-known contributor to the BSSH instructional course uh, lectures and events that go on. He's an FRCS auth examiner and he is also uh an editor for the journal of hand surgery so he's super active and very well known in our little goldfish bowl of hand surgery he has very uh graciously offered to be the chair of tonight's session uh for which we're very grateful i'm sure he's going to do a great job so that's all from me i'm going to hand you over to zaf and i hope you all enjoy the rest of the evening thank you roman uh, good evening uh, and good evening to everybody tonight Thanks for giving me uh, the role tonight of uh, being chair for this uh, uh, event tonight uh, and the session on distal radius fractures. Uh, clearly a, a complex subject, but yet uh, dominates our clinical practice as hand and wrist surgeons and as orthopedic surgeons, just the sheer volume of distal radius uh, work there is. So um, personally tonight, I'm looking for answers on, uh, for myself and on behalf of all the delegates to all those uh, questions that we have when we're managing uh, this injury. Uh, and um, I'm really pleased that we've assembled the faculty that we have uh, to be able to um, deliver uh, tonight's session. Um, so uh, my colleagues tonight, uh, Sumed Tolwalker, um, consultant hand and wrist surgeon at Wrightington, uh, Lindsay Muir, consultant hand and wrist surgeon with myself at Salford Royal, and Lisa Leonard, consultant hand and wrist surgeon in Brighton. Uh, and I will introduce them more formally um, um, in, in due course. Um, the, the format is going to be that we will start with, uh, with Sumed, 
uh, in his talk on what do we know about this injury. So Sumed's going to appraise the evidence in a short sp space of time, no mean feat, uh, considering the, the sheer volume of evidence uh, or literature there is on distal radius fractures. Uh, I'm then going to invite Lindsay uh, Muir to talk about the um, pitfalls uh, in managing this injury and something that we all need to play uh, close attention to. Um, and uh, he has a vast medical legal experience. Uh, and then we will go to Lisa, who will um, share with us uh, uh, tips and tricks and pearls, but we'll mix it all up and have everyone contributing. So uh, Sumed, uh, I'd like to welcome you if you're there. Are you able to pop, pop on Sumed? Yep, here we go. So I'd like I to formally, formally introduce you Sumed. Um, <laughs> Sumed's a, a good friend and colleague of mine in the, in the Northwest region. Uh, like I said, he's a consultant hand risk surgeon at Wrightington. Uh, he's actually, in fact, the divisional director uh, in Wrightington. And if um, that isn't enough work for him, he's also very heavily involved in the uh, fellowship program at Wrightington, uh, managing the trauma overall um, uh, between uh, Wigan and Wrightington. And of course, the very well-renowned FRCS courses, which I highly recommend uh, to you all uh, that are run at Wrightington. He's, he's published, uh, as you will all know, um, uh, over the years uh, with special interests in arthroplasty and, of course, the wrist. And he's currently on the Council for the British Society for Surgery of the Hand. So, Sumed, uh, I'm really looking uh, forward uh, to this talk on what we know about distal radius fractures because um, I, I'm not quite sure myself what we know. So hopefully you can en en enlighten us all. Super. So thanks. I'm sure you can see me. We've tested that. So we, we, we've known about this injury for close to 200 years, um, having um, with, with Abraham Hakkali's first description. Um, so what do we really know about distal radial fractures? We do know that one in 10 women by the age of 90 will have sustained a fracture of the distal radius. And as the population continues to age, these figures are likely to increase further. Uh, so what are we really trying to prevent in these injuries? It depends on your perspective. As a patient, you want um, less pain, more function, uh, and a, a reasonably good looking hand. While as a consultant or as a clinician, what we want to do is to avoid poor outcomes, poor results with, ine with the inevitable issues surrounding litigation. Now, despite the frequency with which distal radial fractures occur, many basic questions remain unanswered. There is some consensus, however, with some of the radiological indices, and we'll run through these very quickly with the, the radial inclination, the volar tilt, and the radial variance, as well as indices surrounding the step and the gap. And we often use these figures for the purposes of describing radial, uh, distal radial fractures. But how useful are these indices really in real life? So Joe Dias, as he has done with a lot of things around the wrist, has written this uh, this paper where he looked at the reproducibility, the inter-observer error between these indices, and you find that there's a, a very clear winner with the volar tilt, with the intraarticular step and gap lagging far behind. So in terms of descriptions, in terms of our ability to, to describe this particular injury, probably the volar tilt is something that we, sh we should look at. The other issue is really between, um, you know, we will hear a little bit more from Lindsay depend up about what our peers feel. And this is also a very important study, which was commissioned by the BSSH, which is a Delphi study, where experts were assigned, asked to assign values to these thresholds. And there are no real surprises here. The ulnar variance and the dorsal tilt uh, win hands down uh, with the ages of 38 and 58, with a little bit of disagreement uh, and with the over 75s, where some experts were willing to accept uh, nearly a five millimeter gap. Uh, we know that the diagnostic sign of a distal radial fracture is the dinner fork deformity. So it's useful to know what the surrogate measures of this could, this could be. And these essentially relate to the various indices that um, are associated with the, with the carpal bone. So you have the carp capitate shift and so on. But how do these measure against the, the actual dorsal tilt? And when you compare these, what you find is that once again, you have one winner, which is it's always useful to have this because you can focus the literature on that. And that is the capitate shift. So we know that the normal capitate shift 
is uh, uh, it usually lies four millimeters in front of the bowler axis of the radius with a range of minus two to seven millimeters. And if you remember that figure of 10 degrees, it's, it's e easier to see in this diagram that when you look at the dorsal tilt, the dors actual dorsal tilt that is required to keep the capitate shift within acceptable level approaches to 9.1 degrees. So this corresponds to the 10 degrees that most experts would accept. Uh, and explains why uh, most people are willing to accept this as an acceptable range. Now, we know that we, we, we tend not to walk around the earth with goniometers, and I personally find the capitate shift quite a good method, a good index to get a, a handle on, uh, on, the, on the dorsal tilt and in terms of acceptability. But this is all very well. How do these radiographic outcomes really compare with clinical outcomes? And uh, once again, you have a bit of a, a mismatch. You see that small amounts of radial shortening can affect function. The tilt seems to be more forgiving. And we'll come to the articular step a little bit later because a, a lot has been written about it by, by Jesse Jupiter and by other colleagues. Let's look at this uh, trial which occurred in the 80s where uh, Joe and his colleagues looked at treating uh, minimally displaced distal radial fractures and, uh, and mobilized them very early. They looked at nearly 187 patients who were randomized between uh, using a plaster and uh, mobilizing them early with a crepe bandage. And they found that using a crepe bandage alone in a minimally displaced fractures uh, produced better results. How does this translate 30 years down the line? You know, when you have people in their 80s running marathons, time, times have changed, people are more demanding. The 65, 65 is like the new 55. Um, so, you know, this is one of the classic things that you would probably see in a &E. um, They get reduced by the time they turn up at your fracture clinic, it's eight days down the line. And things have changed a little bit from the post-reduction film. And it'd be nice to know uh, which one of these fact, uh, fractures would become unstable and, uh, you know, probably make you come unstuck in the future. So these are some of the sobering figures. This is a, a figure which has been picked up from Margaret McQueen's article and quoted in Jesse Jupiter's new book on distal radial fractures. And it's quite sobering, you know, when you learn that two thirds of distal radial fractures can re-displace after an initial uh, reduction or from a minimally displaced position at presentation. So let's look at this paper a little bit more closely. 4,000 distal radial fractures that were assessed prospectively and they looked at minimally displaced fractures and displaced fractures using the 10 degrees and the three millimeter threshold and early and late displacements, depending upon whether it was at two weeks or at six weeks uh, around the time of union. Uh, and they found that uh, minimally displaced fractures, there was a 10% chance of early dislocation and a 22, so one in five occurring at, at six weeks and these were treated conservatively. Uh, and these were some of the predictive factors. A lot of this we already know, but it's good to have a trial that actually looks at vast number of patients because it gives you that little bit of rigor in terms of the, of the science. Uh, so early predictive factors and late predictive factors, age plays a very important factor. 80 years is, is, a, is a, it seems to be the cutoff. Combination, usually dorsal or volar, it doesn't matter. The prognosis is poor, and angulation and variance seems to be more of an issue with minimally displaced factor, uh, fractures in the early stages. No surprises with displaced fractures. If you are displaced, if the fracture is uh, out of position in a, in a significant kind of way, it is almost certain that further down the line that there will be displacement either early or late. So in, in, in summary, I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, the, with the relentless march of age, there are chances that the fracture could displace. In the in prediction of malunion, the presence of combination is very important. And the position of the fracture, the starting point, is, is crucial. So it's not enough to just look at the post-reduction films. Please look at the initial fractures. So there's a whole list of predictors of instability that the paper uh, talks to, and it's very, very much worth reading this paper. I'll just go to the last point, you know, the, the volar continuity. This is an interesting classification by Zenki and all, et al. And I find this quite useful. So when there's this little step, this intermediary step, the authors speak to the possibility of instability. I find this little step difficult to reduce, uh, closed. 
Inevitably, this is something that requires open reduction. There are innovative techniques. You can use an X-fix. You could use the arthroscopy, um, um, the Chinese finger traps to produce distraction. But trying to do it close to get this sort of reduction is really quite difficult. And something which is well worth keeping in mind. People tend to underestimate what uh, a wiring involves and closed reduction involves. And this is a good paper to read as well. Let's look at one of the classics, intraarticular fractures of the distal end of the radius. It's, it's by, by Jesse Jupiter. It ranks as one of the most cited manuscripts in orthopedic literature. But subsequently, because of um, the, the passage of the relentless passage of time, 23 years of advancement, there have been a, a number of issues that have come up. We know that the radiographic analysis probably inaccurately looked at. There was no intern observer or intra observer validation. They didn't have CT or arthroscopy. And when you look carefully at the paper, complications were seen in the operated group. We still accept the two millimeter uh, value as an appropriate value. And it's, this is used quite often, not just in the wrist, but even in uh, other joints. So for example, the tibia, whether it's correct, correct or not, uh, remains to be seen. There are other issues surrounding radiographic arthritis, radiological changes, which are not really supported in the literature in terms of narrowing uh, occurring secondary to the presence of a step. So what does the literature say regarding treatment. We've had two draft trials. The first one was published in the BMJ in 2014, where K-wiring was compared with locking plate fixation, and the authors reported the outcomes at 12 months and said there was no difference between these two methods of treatment. The, these trials are very difficult to, to set up, uh, to acquire funding for, and I, I do have a lot of sympathy with the authors. But there, there were certain issues, there were certain criticisms which were leveled at the authors. You know, it is one of the largest RCTs, it's a pragmatic study, but 75% of the fractures treated with plating were put into a cast post-operatively. So that sort of confounds the, the outcomes. And uh, the study was also criticized for its lack of uh, a long enough follow-up. And these were some of the other issues. To address the follow-up, there was a follow-up study done at five years, and the authors essentially found that uh, once again, there was no difference between the two groups. Now, one of the major limitations with this study and others of this type is that follow-up becomes a problem at five years. So the, the data that you get at the end of five years is perhaps not as robust. There are plenty of papers and RCTs which prove exactly the opposite, which is slightly confusing, but not surprising that, um, you know, water plates still tend to work better than KYs although the findings are that the changes are essentially better initially, and then everything else evens out. Mohit Bandari did a meta-analysis of these papers, and he essentially found that the DASH scores uh, at 12 to 33 and 12 months were better uh, with roller plates as compared to, to, to K wires. And then he suggested that perhaps, you know, there is a specific type of radiographic injury, a specific pattern of uh, injury within the distal radius that lends itself perhaps to fixation with water plates rather than with, with, with K wires. So the direct second draft study, which came out recently, compared K wires against fixation with plasters. Again, there's a significant dropout rate, you know, where you have 200, uh, nearly 2000 people excluded because of surgeon preference. The other issue was with randomization, because when you identify these cases in clinic, at that point in time, you're not able to decide which group it goes into. The actual randomization occurs under anesthetic, and this produces a significant amount of problems with equipoise, particularly with surgeons. So some surgeons would perhaps prefer to go ahead with water plate fixation, fixation or other methods of fixation rather than k -wire. Let's look at what is occurring on the other side of the pond. Kevin Chung uh, has produced the risk study where he compared uh, the three methods with, with, um, with casting, the standard sort of consort for, uh, follow-up for these randomized controlled trials. So this, this was a multi-center study which was done. Uh, he used the Michigan hand score, the primary summary, as well as the domain scores. And what you find once again is the volar plate does best. Initially, the external fixators don't do so well throughout and the KYs are somewhere in between. Um, so the MHQ domains, again, similarly, the roller plate tends to do quite well with worse scores for the external fixator. A little blip with uh, roller plates doing better as regards grip strength, so that sort of confounds the findings uh, as compared to external fixator and pinning. But this is really a very interesting slide because we don't really get to see 
patients who've done well with molar plates at 12 to 24 months. Um, uh, and what you can see in this particular uh, paper is that although there are no changes in the primary outcome measure, which is the MHQ summary, the MHQ for pain and grip strength appear to improve significantly. So the, we can tell our patients that if you're doing well at 12 months, the likelihood is that you will continue to do well up to 24 months. This is Manulian by treatment. And this was something that uh, the draft two looked at as well, where there was a significant um, rate of slippage when it comes came to casting. But effectively, these patients did not appear to come to much harm. And in terms of outcomes, the team seemed to do as well as water plating or K wiring. So the, the, the blue book, we're very lucky to have Lisa Leonard here with us, who is one of the authors. I would strongly recommend that, uh, that you look at this, particularly if you're a new consultant, you want to set up uh, a, a distal radial pathway. It really sets things up for, for you in terms of what needs to be done, uh, what position the, the wrist should be mobilized in if you want to set up a system within your fracture clinic to make, to, to, to make sure that you have a standardized way of, of, of treating these fractures. Uh, uh, I won't go into great details, but once again, the blue book talks to the fact that um, depending upon the age of the patient, if you're above 65, surgical intervention does not really change uh, the surgical outcome. Open reduction in internal fixation is not superior to KYs based on a similar sort of data, which you would see um, with, with the draft trial and a little bit about the ulnar styloid fixation. So we, we've uploaded a picture on, on OrthoHub with, with the radial styloid. And one of the things that the blue book and the literature would say is that one of the things that needs to be done after every distal radial fixation is a, a thorough assessment of the dist, distal radio on the joint. And if the distal area radio on the joint is not unstable, as far as possible, the, distal, the, the ulnar styloid does not need to be fixed. Various methods of fixing it, we could use a tension band wire or a hook plate. Um, and both of these would give reasonable results. In many ways, the distal radial fracture, one of the things that comes out in the literature, represents a diverse spectrum of injuries, and it, it changes. It changes on confounding variables that are related to patients. We know that the anatomy itself does not correlate well with outcomes, particularly in older patients with low functional demands. In younger patients, it is likely that there may be a, a weak correlation, but by no means a significant one. Um, but as far as possible, the ask is to achieve normal anatomy as much as possible. In my view, fractures should be fixed for the, the, the right reasons, and they should be done for earlier restoration of movement, function, rotation, strength, and preventing things like ulnar carpal abutment. Um, does this really prevent osteoarthritis? You know, how, how likely is it for something to become something like this? There is no support in the literature to, to support this. Uh, it, 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 is, it is increasingly likely that although patients do have some diminution of, uh, of, of, of uh, joint space, the likelihood is that this does not necessarily lend itself to symptomatic um, arthritis of the, of the distal radius or of the wrist indeed that would require fixation. We also have to now look at how we treat patients post-COVID, you know, so sort of through a COVID lens. Things have changed. There are national guidelines, minimum percentages of virtual clinics, huge elective pressures. There's always the chance of uh, an outbreak. We've got problems with reduced face-to-face -face contact. We have reduced access to services. Um, so when you look at something which is resource hungry uh, in terms of clinic attendances with distal radial fractures or with k wires, things become a bit of a problem. Now, you, you, it is important to understand, particularly among some of the younger surgeons, that treating something conservatively is, is, is almost an art form. Um, you must remember when you look at the draft trial that uh, one out of eight patients would require further uh, intervention and manipulation. And the chances are that if clinic footfall is reduced, if you find that patients find it difficult to access radiology, if they find it difficult to access uh, uh, any, any other forms of treatment uh, because of, of COVID, it is more than likely that surgical decisions will be affected regardless of what the evidence base is. So if you look at the extremes, you know, with young patients with high energy trauma, fixation is the norm. Again, there's no problem with someone who's elderly, dementia, stroke, lots of comorbidities. You have a, a slightly um, easier way in terms of treating them conservatively. 
However, if you were to keep the same X-ray, but make this person a little bit more active, you know, it could be a colleague who's a golfer, he's got an active life, you suddenly find yourself in a gray zone. And what you then need is bespoke decision-making. And you need to take into consideration things like patient-specific factors and surgeon-related factors. And to this, we probably need to add equipoise, the surgeon's equipoise, the, the fact that patient, the surgeons would be influenced by what is happening around them, particularly in the post-COVID period. So as I said, it's nearly 200 years down the line. Um, are we any wiser as regards this particular injury? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I suppose there's something for, for you to decide. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Sumit, for uh, uh, a real uh, concise summary of the vast uh, literature there is on, on distal radius fracture. I'd like to bring in actually Lisa and Lindsay, uh, if I may, just to discuss some of the aspects of, um, of, of the presentation. Um, uh, good evening, uh, uh, both of you. Um, um, just on, you know, this is a bit of a elephant in the room when it comes to literature, particularly the big studies and our management as hand surgeons of distal radius fractures. Um, just throwing it out really um, based on what uh, Sumit has presented to us. Um, is there any uh, of these big trials which has influenced your practice, if I could ask you? Um, so, uh, you know, one of the telling slides that Sumit gave, which is probably we, we can all relate to, as surgeons who've treated distal radius fractures over a number of years is, is his decision-making slide towards the end of the presentation, uh, talking about patient factors and, and surgeon factors, um, and then performing bespoke surgery based on those factors. Um, and, and I just contrast that with, 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 with the huge studies that have been undertaken. Um, and, and, the, and in fact, the guidelines coming from the BSSH Blue Book, which Lisa, you were involved in, just, just balancing those, those two things. Um, have, has uh, any of the big studies influenced your practice? I'll start with you, Lindsay. Uh, probably not particularly, although the one that has influenced me a bit was the Delphi analysis by Johnson, and Sumed referred to that. And I think that's quite helpful in giving some guidelines because as Sumit says, to me, the literature is just so colossal and so often so contradictory that it's difficult to know what to do for this patient. So I, th I think that that has been helpful to me in, in having some, at least some parameters. And I guess that's reflected largely in the contents of the blue book. Lisa, what's your thoughts? I mean, I think I, I agree. I, I'm, I haven't found much of the literature terribly helpful. And we did do a huge amount of literature trawling for that blue book. Um, um, and it was a very interesting process to go through. And the Delphi was part of that um, blue book formulation. I think it is difficult when you're first starting off. The, the literature is absolutely huge, as you say, Zaf. Um, I got a little bit in my talk about my decision making and how I sort of, sort of crystallise it down to what when do you... When do you fix a fracture? I and mean, I think that's the critical question. In some ways, we've slightly missed the point on some of the research that's been carried out. Um, you know, what, what you really want to know when you're looking at a patient is, do I fix this or don't I fix this? And, and, and that, that we seem to have not really answered that question. And I think it might have been more useful to look in more detail at some of those, you know, radiographic parameters. We all know the, the sorts of patients we're not going to probably operate on. And I think uh, that's part of being a good doctor, isn't it? Learning to know your patient. Um, but the radiographic uh, sort of fracture factors and then what we can do as surgeons, the surgeon factors, I think those two things are the bits that we've got more control over and decision making there is, is a bit trickier. So I, I, I will touch on that. And it, it, the three radiographic fractures uh, features that I use are essentially similar to the ones that the Delphi analysis suggested were predictive, or at least in some way predictive, of a poor functional outcome. Lisa, I mean, we're going to move on to, to Lindsay's talk, and then, then hopefully your talk, and then some some actual cases to discuss with, with the time that we have available. But just just one one thing there. So you, you're an author of the Blue Book, and the Blue Book says not to operate on patients over the age of 65. Do you follow that? No. Okay, so I'm glad you say that, Lisa, because that's one of the things that I'm finding most difficult 
And there was a paper from Florida. I was desperately trying to find it. And I just kind of put my finger on it. And they said geriatric patients. And to them, I imagine Florida is full of 90-year-olds running around playing tennis. And then geriatric was over 60. Well, it's over 60 is old codgers. This is over 60. I, I have to say, the nearer you get to 65, the less you feel that 65 is the threshold you would be choosing. No, I mean, Brighton, I always remember an 82-year-old guy who came in with a broken wrist who'd done it while he was kite surfing uh, in Brighton. And uh, I just, you know, I'm like, I can't treat you like a, a 95-year-old. Or, But obviously then you see the 75-year-old demented patient who who's in a nursing home and has everything done for them. And I think you do have to... Yeah, you do have to tailor your decision making in conjunction with the patient. It's really, really important. And I'm sure that will come out in your talk, Lindsay, um, in terms of medical legal things. It's so important that you carry the patient with you. So um, so that's a good way to, to segue into into Lindsay's talk, who may be able to tell us whether whether we can use the blue book as, as our defence when we don't operate on patients over the age of 65 when we're in court. But can I formally introduce Lindsay? Um, who is my, my great pleasure to introduce him formally. He's obviously my consultant colleague at, at Salford Royal at the Major Trauma Centre there. Um, Lindsay's uh, uh, been uh, working at Salford for many years. Um, his fellowship training was in orthoplastics uh, a long time before orthoplastic training became official or, or uh, an official pathway uh, in the UK. He's of course well, well published um, uh, and uh, lectured all over the world. He, he was chairman of the instructional courses of hand surgery for the British Society of Surgery of Hand uh, and uh, currently sits on council for the BSSH, uh, having previously been also an examiner for the British Hand Diploma. Uh, and I can unveil today a world exclusive in that he is set to become the chief examiner for the European Board of Hand uh, Surgery uh, in the summer uh, of this year uh, and will head up um, the FESH uh, exam board. Uh, as of this summer. So, uh, Lindsay, uh, please, if you could take it away. Okay, um, first thing is to uh, share the old screen. Uh, has that come on there, Zaf? Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Yes. Well, thank you very much, everybody. The reason really why you are, um, why I'm in the middle between uh, Zaf and um, and Sumed and Lisa is because this is your time to go and get a nice cup of tea so that you can enjoy um, Lisa's talk next. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about medical legal considerations. I, I, like Zaf, I work here in the north uh, west of England and uh, the hospital looked almost like this. I've been there so long when we started, but it's a bit more modern looking now. Uh, one disclaimer is I know a little bit about hand surgery, but I do not have any medical, uh, any legal training. And so what we hear tonight is not official legal counsel, you must consult a solicitor if you're in trouble or your defence society. So don't say, well, Lindsay Muir said that uh, won't carry much weight in court. However, I've done quite a bit of personal injury reporting and more recently I've done a bit of negligence reporting. So let me see if I can run through some of the aspects that seem sort of helpful to me. Um, I thought it might be helpful. To, I know you know all this, so I'm going to run through it quite quickly, but it might be helpful just to uh, remind ourselves of some of the critical tests in medical negligence. Firstly, there has to be a duty of care. Well, normally there's going to be a duty of care because by the time they pitch up in your clinic, then you owe them a duty of care, the patients. You have to breach that duty, and we can discuss what is the threshold for that in a minute. And as a result of that breach, harm has to follow on from the patient. So if the outcome would have been the same, even if you had done a much better operation, they'd still have lost their hand, then um, no matter how bad your surgery was, they don't have a valid claim in negligence. And then you remember that there are a number of tests that are important, uh, the, um, and they're listed here. We'll go through these quickly, the, uh, the important case law that we all know about. So Bolum um, was the one where uh, Judge McNair indicated that if you have acted in accordance with a practice that is reasonable, that a reasonable body of orthopedic surgeons or your peers would uh, it seem was reasonable, even if they disagree with you and they would have done something different, then you are not negligent. So this sort of standard that's applied in the UK is um, that no uh, orthopedic surgeon or hand surgeon exercising a reasonable standard of care would have done this or that or, or omitted to do this or not spotted that or operated or not operated. 
So it's no reasonable body of, of orthopedic surgeon. Then, um, of course, Belito clarified that a little bit by saying that it's not enough just to go and get two of your chums to say, listen, can you tell the judge that it was fine what we did, that um, really cutting the median nerves perfectly satisfactory treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and um, oh, is that thing I have presenter view on? Sorry, I thought I had um, full screen view on. Um, is that better, Zaf? Sorry, guys. I am um, right. I, I shall keep going, and I'll try and uh, fiddle away here. So, um, well, you just need to see the next slide, I guess. Try that one. Uh, so um, the, uh, in Belitho, they said that the judge has to be satisfied that of what you were doing was reasonable. And then uh, turning to consent, and this is an important part, the, the, um, the, the case of um, Sidaway indicated that, um, and this was a lady who had uh, tragically had a um, spinal cord injury, um, Sorry, guys, um, I thought I had this uh, sussed out. Um, uh, uh, that um, the, um, your opinion, uh, sorry, uh, in Sidaway, um, the, the Lord, this is a lady who had a, a, a tragic a spinal cord injury and survived a spine surgery, and it was held that 1% was uh, sufficiently low a rate of injury to not um, need to be mentioned in advance. However, um, Lord Scarman uh, presaged in some ways Montgomery by saying that uh, you had to inform the, the patient of the, some of the risks. And then, of course, the case that we all know about 30 years later, Montgomery versus Lanarkshire Health Board, whereby this is an obstetric case, and uh, the, the, it's worth reading. It's easily available online, this case. Um, it's worth uh, reading the full judgment because it indicates how um, important it is to discuss the, the treatment that you're offering and the reasonable alternative or variant treatment. So this is what Lisa and Sumed were mentioning a minute ago. And the level of risk is not 1% or 10% or 0.1%. It's the level that the patient might expect to, uh, to want to know about. And so we've got all these guidelines that um, we might to refer to, and the guidelines don't, just because you follow the guidelines doesn't mean you can't be negligent, and just because you don't follow the guidelines mean that you're automatically negligent. But of course, for all that they're very smart people, the judges and barristers, and some of them know the literature very, very well because they've done loads of cases, loads more than you have or I have, they um, do like to have something on which to base their opinion. And if you say, well, I've followed these guidelines and I studied them and these were approved by the BSSH and I did this and it went a bit belly up, then at least that's a good place to start. And as you know, um, uh, our learner friends are not slow to uh, pick up on any foibles or, or mistakes you might make. So I thought we might just run through what happens when a patient comes to see you and look at each of the stages of management of a distal radial fracture and then see what might go wrong at each individual step. So we, the, this is a 28-year-old lady. She comes, she's fallen off her snowboard a, a week ago, and she's flown back and she'd like treatment here. So you go to assess her and take a history and so on, and then you're going to decide what to do. If you're going to operate, you're going to ask her to sign a consent form and discuss surgery and risks with her. Then you're going to operate, and then you're going to follow her up. And in all of this, of course, remember, record keeping is so, so important. Now. Uh, there are three papers looking at sources of litigation in uh, across three countries, and they are UK, Finland, and USA. The USA paper wasn't really quite so particularly helpful. Perhaps their legal system is too much different. But if we look at the UK data, and this was published uh, by a group from here in Manchester, so this is over 17 years, 266 settled claims. So that's not the total number of claims submitted. That is the number who, that were settled. Oh, God. Um, Zaf says you can't see the slides. Um, let me just 
stop shearing and try and reshear here. Um, we had this, we tried this earlier and um, it was working fine. Zaf, can you text me? Is that better now? Uh, no, we've just got the, the front slide, the, um, the, first, the first slide. Okay. Yeah. If you go to PowerPoint. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's it. And then press play there on the, on the bottom right. So if you go back to PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, actually, if you just expand that, then we can, yeah, we can deal with that. It just expand that. You can try pressing play there again. Yeah, try that. Is that, that working now? Uh, we've yeah. just got the slides, but and that's fine. You can skip through the slides. So yeah. we're on slide eight there. Yes. So does it say stages of management? No, we've got, well, I've got, got here, Bolum. Right. Yeah. Okay. There we go. That one, right, okay. That's sorry, absolutely guys. fine. That's absolutely fine. Thank so you. Cool with that. So, uh, sorry about that. So, um, the, the, uh, this is litigation and this was published in uh, Manchester. And uh, if you look at uh, assessment and decision making, so that's deciding what you're going to do and assessing them and following them up with x-rays, as Suma had said at the beginning, will indicate um, the, the drive your decision making as to whether you're going to operate or not. Surgery had a remarkably low number of, of, um, of um, claims, but I think that's probably more now. The ones I see are rather more related to surgery. And then the post-op management, for instance, you didn't spot the hematoma or the infection or the CRPS. So let's go through each of these stages. Assessment, we've discussed age already. Are there any associated injuries? That's a sort of FRCS uh, type question. Is the fracture stable? Do you understand this fracture? We'll come on in a minute to see a, a case. And then how are you going to follow them up? So here is the assessment. This is our snowboarder. And you might want to spot that the DRUJ is a little bit wide. And also you might want to have a careful look down here because down here is this longitudinal split in the uh, distal radius. So if you put on a nice short plate and a minimal exposure, but then all your screws go through that split and then the fracture falls apart, then the next step that the patient will do when she leaves your clinic is go and see Mrs. Sue Gravit and run. So um, uh, be careful and make sure you understand the fracture uh, configuration carefully. And here's one where perhaps the fracture configuration was not quite so carefully understood. And they looked at the radius and they said, well, there's not too much to see there. And the radial inclination and the radial height and the radial angle and the radial and the radial length are all fine. So they put them in a plaster and then they compounded that by not following them up for two weeks. And then the solicitor pounced on the fact that this is an intraarticular fracture and should have been operated on in three days because they grabbed the blue book. And of course, and they didn't understand the fracture because the fracture is not just a simple fracture, but it's a fracture dislocation. And so this patient needed rather more extensive surgery, I think, and um, uh, was sent, uh, sent along by his solicitors for an opinion. Actually, I think they would have done quite badly anyway, but um, he's done more badly by this not being spotted. So decision-making, well, the Sumit's touched on that uh, already. You might be interested to have another look at that paper um, in the recent uh, Journal of Hand Surgery and then the, the guides that are available to you to form a decision. Consent. I make no uh, apology for reproducing the, um, the, the quote there from Montgomery. Remember um, to discuss what are the alternatives. And I think when the literature is so uncertain, then it's probably worth uh, discussing with them the pros and cons of wiring and non-operative management and operative management. Particularly, it's the, it's the decision making is a bit more nuanced. And a lot of elderly patients actually will be very happy not to have an operation and not to feel pushed into one. Surgery is the next step. So you decided you're going to operate. So use a system if you can that you're familiar with where you know the trajectory of the screws, you know how it all fits together, you know that they're sharp screws or blunt screws or whatever. Um, watch out for the nerves. Try to reduce the fracture and try to use appropriate screw lengths. And, and so let's look at some of those. Uh, firstly, the nerves, if you dorsiflex the wrist uh, uh, to get a good exposure and put a load of retraction on, then the palmocutaneous nerve is at risk. And remember that the next structure when you retract the FCR uh, and you're dissecting down the radial side is the median nerve. So don't prime that. 
and then uh, screw length. Now, this is something that the solicitors pick up on. Um, if we look at this picture here on the left hand side, this screw is clearly too long. And probably you could be able to see that in your intraoperative film. So if you see it in the intraoperative film, then change it and put in a shorter screw and then you'll stay out of trouble. And when you see this one here in the this picture here is a different case. This screw is really, really near to the dorsum cortex. So you might worry, is this screw a little bit too long? And it, no screw needs to be that long because when you look at the distal radius, this bit here is the bit that is the subchondral plate that needs to be supported, the bit outlined in red. And anything above that doesn't really contribute much to stability. So all your screws need to do is reach the dorsum of that red bit, and they should look a little bit like this. And if you're not sure, get the skyline view. I know these are all too long. This is my skateboarder, but the size below was too short. And then if you're interested, then look at uh, zoom grading. And I was glad to say that I was able to put this one in with uh, uh, unchanged and unvarnished. Now, of course, if you get the screws too long, then uh, thank you to Zaf for this um, picture. Then you can do two things. You can stick them all through the back and bugger the extensor tendons and then for uh, as a starter for 10. And then for a bonus point, you can leave one of the screws sticking out through the plate and you can get the FPL as well. So that's, uh, that's full point. So try and make sure that your screws are all neatly screwed down and don't have them too long. And uh, this was a patient who tripped in this alleyway and didn't have very far to go because just at the end of the alleyway was our friend's no win, no fee solicitor. So they will be straight over the road there. And remember that not every fracture needs to be plated. 49 year old man with polytrauma, that's the original film, reduces quite well, then slips the day afterwards, as uh, Sumed said, a CT scan of appalling quality, but still slip back a little bit. So K wires can be perfectly satisfactory treatment. Not everybody needs a plate and you can reduce the fracture reasonably well that way. Um, sometimes indeed you're better off with K wires. Uh, this man here is not one of mine, I'm pleased to say, has this plate put on. If the plate's lying obliquely across the radius, then this is unlikely to give you such a great result. And so this had to be revised and revised just to some K wires. Um, fortunately, the K wires obscured the fracture. This patient, uh, another medical legal case, and uh, turns up with this fracture. I think we'd all agree there's a reasonable indication for surgery. So what plate are we going to use for that? Well, we've got all our choice of all these shiny brochures um, and with, of ever greater complexity. And if we really want to be a little bit on the cheapskate side, then we could use one of these plates and we could look at the brochure, but maybe not look too carefully at the brochure because if we look at this picture here and we follow that exactly, then this one also has some screws at the back. So don't follow that brochure. But instead, we use this plate and don't reduce the fracture. And then um, this is the inevitable outcome. And not helped by the fact that there was some delay in recognizing this. And then it was sent to another hospital who did their best. But actually, the end result is not that great from a fracture that was probably relatively straightforward on day one. And this plate is not even bent. So it's a bit understandable that the patient then consults their learner friends. So um, these are, those were all cases from, from medical legal practice. I wonder if we might just sort of summarize all of those points by showing you one of my cases. So um, it's only myself to criticize and feel free to critique at the end. A 22 year old lad, um, straightforward, fit and well, falls from significant height, has one isolated injury of distal radial fracture. So he's young, there's no doubt that we're going to manipulate that or do something to try and reduce it. And uh, he's put in a plaster in the AE department and he's given a pound, it looks like, to, for his bus fare home, and he's not better. So one of the other teams manipulates it. Now, I, I don't think this was probably ever fully reduced. And it goes back to that point that Sumit made about the step on the roller surface and probably wasn't probably hitched. But I mentioned earlier about record keeping. And this chap has no films to show that it was adequately reduced on the lateral seat. These are the only two images that are saved. So when he says, no, it's well reduced, Your Honour, he's going to struggle to prove that. Because, and the other thing is, and it goes back to uh, post-op management, in the post-op instructions, it says, see one week, X-ray on arrival. So that was fine. Trouble is, he doesn't get another appointment for another two weeks. So by the time he turns up in my clinic two weeks later, I do all the clever measurements and I say, well, he's a little bit short and he's displaced a little bit further. 
and it's got a bit of dorsal tilt, I better reoperate. So I'm thinking straightforward fracture, well, this will be no trouble. Well, of course, by the time we get to theatre, it's now 21 days post-surgery, and it's the devil's own job to unpick this solidly united fracture. And um, here, so this is certainly not soon zero. And um, I, when you see the post-op films, you will see um, that it's not that fabulous a reduction. Two days after the osteotomy, he comes back into hospital and he says, I'm very, very sore. So they admit him to the ward and they go back and the, the ward doctor checks up on him. And three times during the night, he goes to wake the patient up and say, are you sore? Have you got any pain? And he says, yes, it's very sore. And then he goes back to sleep. So the next day, what do we do? We explore him from compartment syndrome um, because he's been admitted with pain. I know um, it's always better to explore a normal compartment than to miss a compartment syndrome. And then he actually makes a very good recovery and he's back at work very quickly thereafter. And these are the final films. But when you look at these films and look at the pre-op films, then I wonder whether actually the difference between the two is that one has got a plate in it and one doesn't. I've probably corrected the bowler tilt a little bit, um, but it, I think he's still a little bit radial shortening. So this case, I think, summarizes quite well what we've discussed. And the original assessment was okay. The decision making he needed something doing was okay. The consent is fine. The original surgery, well, you might argue it wasn't that well reduced on day one. There was a delay in follow up. The uh, record keeping was uh, could have been a little bit better. Perhaps I made poor judgment. Perhaps I should have just left him to um, to uh, and come back to an osteotomy later. I'm not sure I've reduced it 100% at the second surgery, and the compartment syndrome was dubious. So there were a number of places there in one case where um, you might say that we could have done better at the very least. So I'll leave you to decide what you, when you do the medical negligence report for my case, whether you're going to say that I no reasonable um, orthopedic surgeon exercising an appropriate standard of care would have managed this man in this way. Thank you so much for your attention and apologies for the mess up with the slides. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, uh, thank you also for going through in some detail, really, the, the, the medical legal aspects in terms of what's expected from us. And I particularly, you know, liked your, your, um, your line about guidelines won't necessarily save you from litigation and uh, not following guidelines uh, isn't necessarily negligent. Just, just from a junior's point of view, uh, you know, trauma and management of trauma, particularly risk fractures is a team sport. And it's so highly variable where a patient from clinic or A&E ends up and who ends up doing that operation. And then the decision-making, as we're all saying, is not uh, guaranteed in terms of um, the surgeon factors and patient factors. And so you, and, and also there's delays. So what you want to do on day one with a certain surgeon, uh, a junior's on call with that surgeon knows, you know, Mr. Mr. Muir's gonna want to do a plate for this, an ORIF. Um, but then what happens is that the, the, the patient ends up on somebody else's trauma list and et cetera, et cetera. How, how should juniors deal with, what's, what should be the approach when it comes to consenting uh, these patients, which they may often do in A&E or uh, in clinic? I think um, it's, what's probably worth doing is if you're not certain what's going to be done. So if you turn up in the morning and you're doing the consent in the morning and you know that it's Mr. Smith is or Miss Jones is doing the surgery and you know they always played or they always came wire, then you can say that with some confidence. Otherwise, I think it's reasonable to produce a sort of more generic uh, form and to say that they will, and I sometimes do this because that happens to us that we pass patients around from, from between ourselves and Solver. And I say, I am going to discuss with you K-wires and plates, and it will depend a little bit on the surgeon on the day, what they think is best and how it reduces. And then the patient doesn't have any surprises afterwards. So that would be my uh, approach. And your approach to long delays, and, and as Sue had mentioned, the COVID world that we're in, and, and, and it's been commonplace for, for patients to maybe be seen on week one, uh, and, and actually, for whatever reason, they're, they're turning up on the trauma list at week four week five, how, how, any top tips for that? Um, well, I, 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 I um, as you can imagine, if I see patients, I try to prepare, you're always preparing an independent report for the court. 
<laughs> but uh, I so I but I and nonetheless I, I I realized that you know one day somebody was preparing a report about me no doubt so uh, and um, and if, if if we've really screwed up then like the chap with the fracture dislocation then it's right that the patient should get some compensation for it. Um, I, my view is that and as I said this, that that case there that I showed the fracture dislocation the solicitor was right on saying this should have been operated on in three days and I say to them listen guys. Um, that, yes, of course, we'd all love to operate the same day, but it just doesn't happen. And that's not the way it happens virtually in, in, in any hospital that I know, maybe because of writing them, but, or in Brighton, but it doesn't with us, as you know. So um, I, 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 I just say that that's, that's just life. There are, there's too much volume of work for the capacity that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to Lisa, um, just with one eye on the, on the clock. Um, and um, we're really looking forward, obviously, Lisa, to your talk on, on the top tips. This is the kind of holy grail in terms of you're going to tell us how, how to do these operations. So um, to those of you who, uh, who uh, have not personally uh, met Lisa, she is uh, a consultant hand and wrist surgeon based in the trauma, major trauma centre at Brighton. She's actually chief of uh, the surgical division there um, and she's fellowship trained. Oxford and Seattle uh, and has a significant input in the management of hand trauma in Brighton uh, and her master's degree was in wrist kinematics so hopefully we've come to the right source to get our top tips so Lisa over to you. Thanks very much uh, Zaf. Uh, so um, can you see the slides okay? <laughs> okay I good. can yeah I'll just hang on while you while you move the first couple and then. Okay great. Um, oh, I say it won't doesn't want to go down there we go okay that's right okay dokie is that gone down perfect brilliant okay um so i just thought i'd give you a little bit of a heads up because we i do work in quite an unusual unit i don't think there's many um units in the country that work as we do so we we run a hand trauma week system um where we are fortunate enough to have two and a half days of hand trauma theater per week and all the distal radius fractures come to us and the hand surgeons do them all, apart from the very occasional major trauma patient who can't be transferred up to our unit, which is away from the main hospital. And we fix about 25% of all distal radius fractures that come to us. So we don't fix everybody by any means. And so that means that each week you're on call, you're fixing at least three or four. So what do I consider when I fix these fractures? And I think good old Apley, there's not much, um, I think a few of us have touched on this really. So there's in your head, patient factors, fracture factors and surgeon factors. And I'm going to work through those and try and give you a brief outline of, of my thinking and how I approach this. So um, we've already talked about having an honest discussion with the patient. And if there is equipoise, I let them decide because we really don't know the answer to the question, which is which fractures should we fix? Um, there's a very large group of gray in the middle where we honestly can't tell the patient it will definitely be really bad if you don't have this operation or there are some patients in that group. I don't k-wire elderly patients at all anymore ever. I do k-wire younger bone, uh, younger patients with the, um, the sort of configuration that we've seen uh, from Lindsay sometimes because the wires will hold in that sort of bone but if you've got elderly um, bone I don't think the wires really do a great deal of good it just consumes your theatre time and gives them some k wires sticking out of their arm that will get infected uh, and then you take the wires out and the fracture tends to sublux back to how it was in the first place so I treat elderly patients in a plaster or I fix them uh, with a plate if you are going to treat patients in a plaster don't give them complications from the plaster don't make it too tight listen to them if they say they're waking up in agony at night don't put it hugely flexed and on the deviated three point molding should hold your fracture. And I get them all out at four weeks and start gentle movement from a removable splint. I tell them not to hold anything or lift anything heavier than a cup of tea for the first two weeks. And uh, we tell them how much time it's gonna to take to get better. So this is bad, don't do this. And um, don't accept this back slab from ED either. I think there were three rugby players attempting to reduce this little old lady's arm and they didn't actually improve the x-ray either, which is a shame. So that's patients, then fracture factors. And we have 
talked about the literature, which is very, very difficult. And are there any radiographic factors that do reliably predict a poor clinical outcome? Because after all, that's what we're really trying to get to the bottom of. And I think the evidence is pretty weak. Um, the three factors I use are, I do uh, look at if there's an intra-articular step. I think it is difficult to measure that accurately. You often get these uh, sort of x-rays where you, you see a gap, perhaps not a step. Does that count? But I do think sometimes the DRUJ is a bit missed and I suspect there is a, a step in the DRUJ there. So I have a look at that and more than a couple of millimetres and I will start to think maybe we should be doing something. Positive on the variance, I think, is actually probably the strongest predictor of a poor outcome. Um, patients do not tolerate having a very long ulna. And of course, the ulna isn't wrong. It's the radius that's short in these fractures. So the ulna is in the right place but it bashes on the ulnar side of the wrist and they get ulnar abutment and pain. But the literature is, you know, again, a bit vague on how much is too much. Certainly over five millimetres of positive ulnar variance. Um, David Warwick's paper suggests you are going to get a definitely poor result, but even less than that, you're going to really change the load pattern across the end of the radius. So you need to start worrying when you have got strong positive ulnar variance. And a bit like the capitate distance, this is a, um, a, a, an uh, alignment measure originally described by Margaret McQueen, and I don't think she ever published it, but it's essentially looking at a line that would go down the middle of your third metacarpal, which you can always see on the x-rays, if the wrist was straight, and then a line that goes down the middle of the shaft of the radius. And so you can have dorsal tilt, dorsal translation, or volar tilt and volar angulation, and any of those where the second line down the third metacarpal is well outside the shaft of the radius, you start to think you pretty much should be definitely fixing those. But something like this, which is quite badly displaced and is teetering on the edge of the radial cortex also makes me concerned. So that's pretty much it for the, my radiographic measurements. I don't spend a long time with a goniometer and a, and a, and a, a tape measure in, in clinic. And then we touched also on radiographic factors that predict the likelihood of redisplacement. And, and again, it is McQueen's paper that we all go to for this. And essentially for me, it's the age of the patient, the older they are, the more likely they are to redisplace and the initial displacement on the x-ray. So do always look at the original x-rays. Um, we've mentioned this a little bit as well. So if you're not sure, get a CT scan. Uh, know your common fracture patterns, so know your enemy, as it were. Uh, think about your associated injuries, um, what you're going to do with the ulnar styloid on the head, carpal injuries, and ask your colleagues and discuss if you're not sure. And that is one of the strengths of working in a, uh, a team. And that we all work in teams, but sometimes the team is very big, but a, sm a smaller hand team is helpful. Uh, and you'll see other advantages of that as we come through, because this is a bit the good, the bad and the ugly, this talk. So surgeon factors, these are the things that we can actually make a difference about, okay? This is when we can change the outcome for the patients by what we do. So we do nearly all of our surgery under a regional block as a day case. The patients get lots and lots of information. They have lots and lots of post-op analgesia. They all get dihydrocodeine to go home with, and they have a tailored rehab program if they need it, uh, if they need more than just the info sheet. So I'm going to walk you through an example now, so a fairly simple example to just give you a sort of idea of what I do when I'm when I'm actually doing the operation. So here's an extra young woman. She's got an intra-articular step. You decide she's going to need an operation. So when you're in theatre, set things up well. Make sure you've got enough arm on the arm board. You don't want to be squeezed into a corner. We haven't got enough access. I usually tick them. We've got a little mini C arm, which is invaluable with these cases. So get it all wrapped up and I tuck it up and bring it in next to the patient's head. So it's just ready to pop across for all my x-rays. We're currently using the Gemini set, but as, uh, as we've all said before, there's lots of shiny sets, um, but you do need to know your plate and its weaknesses and its strengths. Uh, and we all know the um, six P's of poor surgical performance. So think about what you need to do. So for our lady here, you're already thinking she's got smallish lunate fossa fragment. I'm going to need to get at least two screws in that. I need to see that side of the wrist. So the incision, this incision is too short. And as we'll see as we go through the dissection, 
um, but you must go distal enough to be able to see the whole way across the ulna uh, towards the ulna side of the distal radius. And I'll just show you in a minute about the dissection there. And I like to go much more proximal than this so that you can see where the tip of your, uh, the stem as it were of your plate is gonna land on the radius when you finish fiddling around. So when you go to SCR, don't do that thing where you're going down a smaller and smaller hole. Make sure you dissect all the way to the end of your incision. Come on the radial side, protect the median nerve, but do watch out for your little old lady because you'll find the uh, radial artery can be alarmingly wiggling away there um, if, you're not, if you're not careful, very close. So we freed up, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor wiggling around there, you freed up all the way along to FCR to give yourself plenty of freedom to retract your tissues here. And then you see your FPL, and I usually put my, put my finger in here, there's a little fat pad, push that away, and there's often some fibres of FPL that you'll need to divide to get yourself the proximal axis that you need to see. Then underneath that, you'll then see pronator quadratus, and there's this tissue distally, which gets in the way of you being able to see what you're going to do. And if you pop your finger underneath that layer, that plane is volar to the wrist ligaments and leads into the space of perona, which leads into the, the, um, the palm space in the, in the palm. So everything volar to your finger, when you've gone underneath that tissue, you can divide with impunity. You're not damaging the ligaments at that point. There's often some little arterial branches there that you need to watch out for. So pop your finger under there and make sure you free up as much as you can to get your view distally. Now, in this case, um, it's a bit too distal and not proximal enough but it has got an absolutely brilliant view of the uh, ulnar side of the distal radius. And then you're going to find your watershed now. So I usually again, put my finger in or put the scissors and make sure I'm absolutely convinced where the edge of the radius drops off and I know where I am. And sometimes if it's very displaced, that can be quite tricky. So move the wrist around, feel where you are. And then you can make ideally a nice L-shaped incision in your pronator quadratus, leaving a little, um, rim here of tissue to repair to afterwards, straight down onto the onto the bone. And then simply reduce the fracture. Hmm. And so I use a, a McDonald's very frequently and, and gentle wheedling rather than violent orthopedic um, activity at this point, especially if the bone is very soft in an elderly lady. Clean the edges of the fracture so you can really see um, to get your reduction uh, nicely. In this particular case, I haven't release the brachioradialis and the radial septum, but I nearly always do do that. So go get onto the bone, peel off on the bone, and all of a sudden you'll just see a little glint when the extensive compartment is opened and that's you've, then you've, you know where you are to get the rest of brachioradialis off. Do you see the ulnar side of the distal radius approximately and distally and watch out for the rotation that's very characteristic that you get between the shaft and the distal fragment, which you need to correct and when you put it, before you put the plate on. Other tricks, um, if the fracture is in a lot of pieces, you can rotate the shaft uh, out of the wound and then you can get in to see the fracture sort of from the inside up into the joint. You can't take the ligaments off on the volar side. That's a really good little trick and you can wash and clean and use a little, um, um, sometimes a little uh, retractor, like a skin hook even, can be enough to just fiddle around with your fracture fragments. You can get the plate onto the largest and then tweak and adjust the smaller fragments once you've reduced that onto the shaft. You can use K wires to temporarily hold fragments. I don't find that terribly helpful these days. I rarely do that now because they usually get in the way. And then if you've got some dorsal comminution, as, as uh, Lindsay said, you don't need to fix absolutely every bit of that. But if you can compress down a significant articular fragment while you're inserting the plates in between the, the fingers and the thumb, that's a good trick there as well. So you've got your reduction and your next thing you do is put the plate on and your K-wire. And um, when I'm putting this on, I think very carefully about is the plate uh, flush on the bone here distally? Um, and I don't worry so much about what's going on with the shaft. And very often, if it's a dorsally tilted fracture, you will need to have the tip of the plate sticking well out of the wound. So another reason to have made your incision longer and you can see where it's going to land when you crank it down to correct your volar tilt. Um, and spend a bit of time adjusting this to make sure um, that you have got the plate in the right place. Because if you get the K wire correct, all the other screws should be fine. 
Um, so we've already mentioned about our incision being in the wrong place. And this is the old DVR plate. So your KY should go in the most distal and most ulnar. So um, I then put usually all my distal screws in and then crank it down and put the shaft screw in. So you put this screw in, but not this screw yet. And then you can take some x-rays. And at this point, you can do quite some, still got some useful adjustments you can do to get the x-rays absolutely perfect. So when you're in the oval hole, you can still correct length um, by retracting, pulling out the length that if, as you loosen that screw, um, all of this is now solid for you and you can get a little bit more length if you want to correct um, a little bit of your shortening if it's not quite out to length. And you can also correct the translation. So quite often it's still a touch more radial than you want it to be and your DRUJ is not congruent. So I tend to put some um, um, bone levers in uh, one, uh, one side, one on the other side. And while my assistant's got the screwdriver ready in the overhaul screw, crank it across, tighten it up, and you can sometimes get a nice little extra bit of correction there that way. So spend a bit of time getting your x-rays. This is the good, the bad, and the ugly. So you want your x-rays to look like this, um, where you haven't got the plate sticking out beyond the end of the radius, and the screws aren't too long. You probably don't want it to look like the middle picture, where the plate is really too distal, it's sticking out, that's risking your FPL and the screws are really only just subchondral, but it is difficult if you've got a very distal fracture. Well, we've got a few tricks up our sleeve to how to sort that out when we get to the discussion bits at the end. And you definitely don't want it to look like the right-hand picture. And um, I put this in to um, keep, me, keep me honest. Um, so, you know, somehow I managed to convince myself that these screws were not in the joint, but, Fortunately, because I work in a good team and we have a metal work meeting every every week, um, the guys picked it up. They did the CT scan. They found that the two screws were in the joint. And before the week was up, the patient was back in theatre and had a revision and somebody had had a sensible conversation and done a day text. So take the time and don't be distracted. Don't be too at this point. Um, don't be too cocky. Maybe I was too cocky. And, you know, it only takes a few minutes to adjust the screws and adjust the plate here. If you get the K-wire in the right place in the first place, you shouldn't get this position. But if you do, then accept it and make sure you take the time to change it. Nothing worse than uh, angsting over this sort of thing where what you really want is the perfect x-ray. So um, early revision. And I think doing that will perhaps help avoid later problems then I always try and repair pronated quadratus unless it's been in absolute tatters. And I do think it's worth putting some stitches in there of the distal uh, part to cover the plate and that protects your FPL. I usually use a subcuticular closure, but in a very delicate little old lady skin, I would use interrupted nylon. That's my go-to um, uh, safe suture. I only treat them with a bandage. I would put them in a plaster if they had an associated ulnar head fracture but not for an associated ulnar styloid fracture. I only fix an ulnar styloid if the DRUJ is very wobbly uh, after I fixed it. And I do always check um, that. We, we, had, we were sued once um, uh, as a unit for not checking the DRUJ instability in a lady who then subsequently required the ulnar styloid to be fixed. And we've touched on the rehab. So, mm -hmm. These are the AFT x-rays that you're hoping to get. And this means that you're going to have a nice evening. Um, and if you've got the screws in the joint, you're not going to have a nice evening. But you can see we've collected the, uh, corrected the intra-articular step there. So we've got lots of x-rays to discuss and get on with. So just in summary of what I've tried to present, a short little pricey of the sorts of things I think about. Be honest with your patients. Remember your critical radiographic features that will predict a poor outcome. And also bear in mind the two main features that might predict instability in your particular patient. And uh, know your own limitations. And I think working in a team is really helpful. Discuss cases that are difficult, get CTs if you need to, and have regular metal work meetings. And even when you've done lots and lots and lots of these, I must have fixed thousands of distal radiuses we can still make mistakes so be very critical of your own work but be very kind to your colleagues because you know 
next week they might be the poor ones who are going to have a problem or be dealing with you when you've had a problem. So I hope that was helpful. Um, any questions? I shall try and unshare my screen. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm just going to uh, ask for um, Lindsay and Suma to come on as well as we go into a uh, discussion uh, phase. So um, we hopefully for, for everyone at home, we've um, we've gone through uh, significant um, aspects or perspectives on, on this injury. Um, I'll start actually with some of the questions that the questions have come through um, and I'm, I'm opening it to all of you really. Um, uh, nice question from Gezim uh, Kobaj. Um, which I think is an important point, actually, because um, we, we're, we're not doing much plastering now uh, of distal radius. He, he's, he, well, the, um, Gezim is asking, can you please explain why not palmar flexion and ulnar deviation in elderly patient when you're putting a plaster on? So I think also it's probably worth mentioning about cotton loader position and, and the aspects of that in terms of CRPS. Yeah, so basically it gives them CRPS. So if you if you put your wrist down like this and try and do anything, you'll soon find that it's completely non-functional. So if you give someone a stiff wrist like that, even if they don't get CRPS or acute carpal tunnel syndrome, which they very frequently do, they will be left stiff like that and it, the, the hand is almost functionless. So it, it's a really a very non-functional position to put your wrist in. And I have seen literally people in plasters like that. Um, and I think- well, can... why I would just explain to people why that happens. It's because there's so much focus on fracture reduction. Uh, and, and so the- Yes. That, the, that, that's the, the operating are... surgeon is focused on getting, a, they get a great position. It just happens to be that the wrist is in maximal flexion and all the deviation. I think more often I see it from ED, to be honest with you, yeah. um, they, they put they put them in these weird and one. So I always take the back sub off. I never complete a back sub. I always take it off. I always want to see what the skin looks like underneath and examine for other injuries. And then I get our plaster technicians who are brilliant at doing this to put a molded lightweight cast on. And they, they all know what I like. And they'll give you three point molding and you'll get a nice um, plaster index on that. And, and it, that's the best way. And if it doesn't hold in a plaster like that, it's probably not going to hold anyway. And otherwise you're giving them a really poor functional position and they will get stiff. And then you've got the devil's own job to, re, you know, to retrieve the position from there. I imagine that the, the incidence of CRPS relationship with distal radius is got something to do with historically that that position and the, the high correlation between CRPS and distal radius. I'm going to, um, it, uh, the, there's a question here uh, from Sanil, um, Lindsay, uh, with uh, Sanil saying he finds it very difficult to know when to get a CT scan. So when does uh, getting, when, when should we get a scan and does it actually ever change what you think you're about to set, set out to do? I used to do quite a lot of CT scans and now I only really do CT scan. And the reason for that is because in the main, if you're getting a CT pre-op, then you've decided to operate anyway. And the only time might be if, for instance, there's some bit of what's obviously subcortical bone that is halfway up to the elbow and you're wondering where does that bit come from and how am I going to get that and, and flick it back around because often it's flicked 180 degrees. The, some occasionally I get them if I think this doesn't look quite right on the plane film but I'm not sure I can make it so much better with an operation and occasionally you get the CT in fact I had one in the practical clinic this morning and the CT didn't look as scary as the plane x-ray so then you can afford to treat them not operatively but as operative planning I rarely get them now I don't know what everybody else's experience is okay uh, so, Sumed I had a question for you uh, well I'm going to direct this question at you when um, when when the surgeon is faced with a significant ulna positive variant post trauma, so you know we've been in that situation six weeks, three months down the line, you have a referral, maybe perhaps as an elective referral from a GP, uh, Mrs. So and So is, is, is struggling with her wrist. You do an X-ray, huge huge gap. So the question is um, from one of the trainees is um, you know do we do we address the ulna? Do we address the radius? How do you go about making that decision, Sumed? So if you, if you remember that list, one of the, um, at the end, the second last slide, one of the aims of doing the surgery was to prevent ulnar abutment, you know, to obtain adequate radial height is something that you should aspire to. Sometimes the radius collapses. And I think in my view, 
it's much easier in those situations to do a simple ulnar shortening um, to try and get the joint level rather than trying to lengthen the radius because you find that lengthening the radius is technically difficult to do. You can end up with a with a non-union um, and that, that brings its own problems. While ulnar shortening works, straightforward, relatively straightforward surgery with the new jigs. Um, Zaf, can I just add another anecdote to that question you asked about CT scanning? Mm. You, 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 you probably heard of, everyone's heard of George Orbe, the person who invented that DVR plate. Yeah. So he'd come to Wrightington and I, I asked him, uh, you know, exactly the same question that Sunil asked, that when do you do CTs? So George said, uh, I used to do a lot of them, but then my cardiologist told me not to do them anymore because uh, I used to do the CT and then spend all night thinking about the pictures. Uh, and once I stopped doing them, my chest pain disappeared. So <laughs> I think Lindsay has probably been through the same, same sort of uh, uh, learning curve, you know, because it does, when you look at it, it when you get the whole, um, you know, looking at an X-ray is like looking through a keyhole and doing a CT, suddenly the whole door is open. And then there are lots of things that you've got to make your mind up uh, in, it's not a hard and fast rule, um, but I think uh, you just have to use that judiciously, I think. Yeah. We have another question about the use of above elbow cast. Is this a viable option in an unstable distal radius fracture when operative treatment is not conducive? Does anyone, is, um, has anyone got any experience or is still doing above elbow casts? We no. use sugar tongs if you are worried about the druge. Just yeah. use a little bit of a a sugar tong if there's an issue, but um, yeah. we didn't necessarily do an above elbow for a distal radius. Yeah. Um, so um, just on significant injuries, and I know there's a vogue in the US and Sumed, Sumed will also know this, for doing a carpal tunnel decompression along with the distal radius fracture. Um, there, may, there may be other reasons why that's done in the US. But, but does anyone, um, has anyone got any uh, opinions on whether we should do a carpal tunnel decompression there and then? If, if for example, a patient um, presents with, um, you know, with, with median nerve symptoms, does anyone do that or would you rather wait? Yeah. So in, a, in, a, in specific situations, Zap, so if you're, if you're doing a dusted, unfortunately, I didn't have time to cover that in my literature review. We don't use X fixes anymore, so use an internal fixator. So if I'm doing a span plate in a situation where you've got a sort of polytrauma situation and you may not be able to get to this person again quickly, the, um, uh, and I'm doing it in the first week, I would combine the span plate with a carpal tunnel release. But I wouldn't routinely do a carpal tunnel release um, unless there was a reason. And Lisa put up that picture of the DVR plate where the, you know, your your visualization of the ulnar fragment or the ulnar part of the plate is absolutely phenomenal. So I never get that. <laughs> Somehow, you know, that part of the wrist is really quite difficult to see unless you swing everything radially uh, and then go through that little ulnar corridor between the ulnar nerve and the flexor tendons. Um, but having seen that, you know, that's something perhaps we can all aspire to. I think that was a bit of an extreme, it was a sort of, the incision was a bit extreme, but it does show that you can go, I think people are often, well, certainly my registrar is a bit nervous going distally. They think, oh, it's going to be, you know, the, the wrist ligaments, it's going to be a disaster. Um, but you can protect, if you remember, that, you know, protect the ligaments, then you can get quite a good exposure. But even then, it's still hard. It seems to be the non-self-retaining self-retainers that we have in our hospital, which you, you put them in and everything seems to slip out from under the, and it's, quite a nuisance but anyway it is possible to get a better view i don't do a carpal tunnel unless they've got carpal tunnel symptoms but i absolutely ask every single patient with a distal radius if they've got tingling in their fingers and i absolutely test whether they've got numbness because there's the odd little old lady who go i thought that was normal i don't i didn't bother to be a doctor and then they've got you know persistent numb fingers forever after that so it's always worth asking but and if they come in with an acute carpal tunnel obviously I would do it and I, I would use a separate incision otherwise you're going to damage the palm cutaneous branch. Lisa just just and on the basis that you have two and a half uh, lists a week of access for for hand trauma uh, and um, uh, Sumed, Sumed mentioned in his talk the fact that distal radius fractures that are manipulated uh, the majority of them will go on and displace do you 
think that if there are no neurovascular symptoms, that distal radius fractures should be pulled, or should they just wait for surgery? They should be pulled because you never want an operation unless you have to have an operation. So really? you give them a chance. You always give them a chance. And, so, and I, you okay. know, would so I want an operation unless I had to have an operation? No, I wouldn't. And most orthopedic surgeons are the same, actually. ACLs, you ask how many orthopedic surgeons have had an ACL reconstruction and they still go skiing. So I think you would want the same for you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Lindsay, when do you decide to fix a distal ulna or an ulnar styloid? Um, only exceptionally. And if you look at Greg Giddens' work, his view is that the assessment of the distal radial ulnar joint is, um, is um, not terribly easy and that everybody has some degree of distal radial ulnar joint instability. So I guess the only time might be if there was an ulnar styloid base fracture and the DRUJ was very unstable at the end of your uh, plating. And that's very rare. I, I think I've found either that or I'm not picking them up. And then I might fix the ulnar styloid because it actually adds quite a bit of, it's not that easy an operation to do. And it adds quite a bit of time to your operation. Okay. Um, what, what, I, what I will do, I know we, we're tight on time, but uh, I will... Um, share my screen for maybe one or two cases. Um, and um, maybe we can talk about them. So here we go. Um, um, so, we have a presentation here of a 24 year old gentleman with a high speed RTA, multiple injuries. Your colleagues put an X fix on, and he's now five days down the line. Um, Lindsay, your thoughts on this? Um, I, I just put it on your trauma list, Zach, I think that one. Um, <laughs> Goodness, um, probably, well, the, the injury is confined to the radius. I know there's an ulnar fracture, but probably we don't need to worry too, too much about that. And there's no carpal injury, and I'm assuming there's no injury proximal. So probably um, some form of, it needs to be a very long plate and span it and try not to disturb the soft tissues too much. That big um, fragment there, I might, is probably, that's in between the radius and the ulna, is probably still got some sort of soft tissue attached to it. So I might try and stick that back and, and Span it with a locking plate would be my thought. Yeah, I, I guess know. the I guess the consideration is: Do you think there's enough distal radius for this to be fixed, as yeah. opposed to going to span right across the carpus? Yes, yes, I think there is. It does look like there's enough radius, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So can um, so this is what was done by Lisa, I think actually. So. Um, and um disappointingly yeah but it was a very high energy injury so i guess you yeah. could have predicted that would happen yeah yeah okay um any comments on that sumed yeah so one of the things we have, we're not a level one trauma center thank god so we don't we don't see this but uh, one of the things we found with these long plates when we get some of the sequelae is that it's easy to over reduce because you have very little by way of any landmark. Yeah. As a result, yeah. you know, you've got it absolutely perfect there, but uh, you end up over reducing the distal fragment and the ulna starts sticking out. And then you have to go and take the plate out and then do an osteotomy and the bring, bring the radius back up again. That's the only thing I found with these long plates. It's a, it's a bit of an issue. And I don't think it's a surgeon surgeon's fault as such, because you just have no landmarks there at all, isn't it? There's, yeah. there's a huge right. gap. Yeah. And you, you've done a biological fixation. You haven't put screws in into every single hole. You've clearly left enough space. So that thing in, in every respect is just unfortunate given the type of you know, canvas you were given on uh, in the circumstances you've done very well there. Okay, let's have a look at this one. Um, first comments on the fracture, um, Sumit? Yeah, so it, it, it looks like a significant intra-articular injury. It looks more than likely that um, the lunate fossa is involved. Um, 
Um, and we, we have to think. So this is one of the fractures in which I would seriously consider doing a CT scan to get more information about the anatomy of the fracture because it would then dictate my plan going forward. I want to know whether the combination, whether the main fracture line is primarily dorsal, is the volar cortex completely intact? I want to know what's happening with the uh, druge, what's happening with the um, distal radial nerve joint, the sigmoid notch. I, I want all that information. Okay. You're sounding great, um, Sumed, for someone who runs the FRCS course. Um, the, 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 world, the, world, the world famous, yeah. So there you go. There's your, there's your CT scan, boss. What do you think? So this is um, one of those patterns where, you know, um, the entire volar cortex is intact. You find that most of your combination is dorsal. And the more traction you apply, the more you try to reduce it, you actually end up with, you know, the, do the, the lunate popping out dorsally. And, and, and in these situations, I, these, these are one of the few fractures where you would consider, I would probably consider going fragment specific and going from the back. Uh, remember, if you were to, if you wanted to reconstruct your radial pillar, you can release the entire brachioradialis dorsally or volally. I'm more than happy to go dorsally to release the whole uh, brachioradialis, get the radial styloid down, then get into the joint, raise everything up, and then put an L-shaped plate on the, the ulnar side. So I'm reasonably pleased that the sigmoid notch is not affected. Um, you know, on these two, two cuts. So from that point of view, I would raise the, the die punch fragment, bone graft it. Um, and I think this chap should do quite well. You might have to consent him before, you know, for metal work removal. So if they get a lot of, uh, you know, like a decoy veins type symptoms, that's the only problem with these radial plates. Uh, it's like mm -hmm. a, a wrap. They, they complain that I've got a sarin wrap around my hand. You take that, that plate off. Okay. And um, so we, we've not really touched upon fragment specific, but you know, in, in this situation, just explain to, to the audience um, why a volar locking plate is not going to really help here. Yeah. So what happens in this case is because the volar, you know, I suspected that looking at the, the pre-op films, because the volar cortex is intact, access to the dorsal aspect will be, you'd be completely blinded to what's happening dorsally. So um going from the front is not going to achieve anything so this is one of those exceptional circumstances two or three times a year when i would say that going dorsally would be my preferred approach yeah. okay um lisa do you want to add, any, add anything here uh, no i think and and we didn't conspire uh, <laughs> so, so uh, that that's exactly right i mean you can't see the fracture from the front unless you break the volar cortex which is crazy so and on the back you're going to get you get a fantastic view uh, of the joint surface and you can often see the actual uh, intraarticular uh, surface as well there but you do have to take the metal work off and you do have to be careful with the extensors uh, later on you need to nearly always take the metal work out but and uh, he did do very well, actually, when we took, after we'd taken the metal work out. Despite his schizolinic joint injury. <laughs> no, he didn't have that. I, knew you were I agree, it looks a bit weird on that, on that uh, oblique view, but you, you've got to have to watch out for that and the, the fractures that go up through the, uh, in between the scaphoid and the lunate fossa. Often they do have, that was that paper, wasn't it? Alarming paper where if they scoped them all, 40% had the scaphoid ligament injuries. But um, I, I don't think it's quite that high, really. But uh, yeah, got to watch out for it. And that's one I, interesting, I thought, from the x-ray, because that might catch out the unwary because it didn't look that bad on the end. But then when you look at it again, you think, mm, that doesn't look quite right. So if it doesn't look quite right, it probably isn't quite right. And the CT scan, as you said, don't do that many, but it is useful in that scenario, I think, particularly so you know you're going to go in the back before you start and get the right plates out. Okay, let's let's do another one, um, if I may. So that's the difference uh, between a head examiner and just an examiner, isn't it? I missed the scapegoat unit. That's it. That's it's a completely it. different <laughs> level. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's go let's go for this one. And um, uh, Lindsay. How old's the patient in this one? Um, the patient is, I've got to be careful, is, is 49 years old, right-handed. 
an oh. orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> orthopedic surgeon who did this while she was skiing. Definitely, definitely refer this one to you as well. Um, <laughs> um, well, um, probably, I, I don't, see so this is one where I don't think a CT scan is likely to help you over much. And um, I would go for fixation because I don't think that you are likely to reduce that particularly well with K wires. Uh, and I would go for plate fixation. And it's not too, too distal. So I think you should manage to reduce that. Yeah. And then have a look at the, the distal radial joint because this is a very basal uh, ulnar styloid fracture here, isn't it? Yeah. So do the screening. So that's the um, post reduction. And um, here we go. And then, um, Lisa, do you want to comment upon this? Yeah, so this is actually one of my colleagues' x-rays. Um, and I put this in because actually, um, uh, it did. I agree, Lindsay, it didn't look that bad on the pre-op films, but actually the lunate facet fragment, if you could just go back to the last film or so, maybe, um, Zaf. The, this, yeah, so the, the lunate facet fragment is quite small. So it's quite narrow and it's also quite short. Um, do, um, proximal to distal. So um, on the, if you go back to the fixation, the geminus plate needs to sit fairly proximally. It's a little bit like the DVR, you can't put it distally. And, and then you see here, the, the fracture is just, it's not holding it. The plate's not holding that fragment. Yeah. So this is a canny little thing they've got on there, which has got some little pins in, which you prod into, you sort of drill them into the volar lip fragment, and then you screw that. It's on, it goes into a little plate, a hook plate, and it screws in. So it's a nice little extra thing. Uh, and it's not as distal as uh, the... Uh, volar rim plate which synthes make which is really quite clunky and um, thick and, and uh, you nearly always have to take it out um, yeah. and, and we have used both there's an example of both in the in the pack but um, this is a neat little solution and a really nice reduction um, that my colleague Mr Ray got um, so I haven't used this yet it's quite a new um, we've only started doing the radius plate for one you don't need it that often this but um, it's another little thing in the armor armory so, Zaf, can I ask a quick question, Zaf? Um, yeah. One of the problems we've seen with the, you know, these little hooks that come out is that they're always in the wrong place. So if you look at the pre-op films, out of the two of those hooks, I think one of them is probably in that lunate fragment, isn't it? And you've got one which is actually gain purchase, which is far more than you would have if you'd moved the plate distally. Um, yeah. But I've, I've always noticed that they're always somehow in the wrong place and you can't really rotate that plate anymore. Uh, because it just simply wouldn't sit properly. So it's just a, a problem I've always noticed that that fixed assembly is always a millimeter or two, bit, bit too radial sometimes. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you think we've discussed enough or, or highlighted the importance of the lunate fossa fragment and the intermediate column tonight? Because it's something I'm always obsessed about is, the, is, is looking at the DIUJ when we're doing the reduction. Uh, and looking at that lunate fossa fragment. I mean, um, I, I'm happy if, if any of you want to chip in in terms of the significance of that lunate fossa fragment being the keystone. For, for me, I, I, you know, the, the first place I look at is the lunate fossa and then build around that. Any, any comments? I mean, I, I agree. I think it's really important. And I think the DIUJ is really important as well. I think it's often overlooked. And, and that's why I make strenuous efforts to, to get the DIU. I really move the x-ray around to make sure I see the DIUJ at the end and I'm convinced the plate's not over it and, and I've got that congruently reduced. And then that's why I was making an effort to explain about with the oval hole, you still got the opportunity there to just jig things around very slightly. So you can get that last millimeter or two um, so that you get a perfect DIUJ at the end of it. And I think poor rotation and stiffness uh, is a problem after um, distal radius fracture if you don't get that right so and the lunate facet uh, sometimes I build it that way and sometimes I build it the other way I mean sometimes the if you've got a really big chunk on the radial side it's easier to do that bit first and then to um, fill it up the lunate facet and get that accurate that way around but yeah it, it, it's horses for courses isn't it when you're in there okay I think that's a it's a not infrequent problem is that the uh, often the plate is not really the right shape for distal radius fractures, because that lunate fragment is not very big. You get one screw in the lunate fragment and the second screw goes in the gap 
fracture. It's an immediate fragment, there's dioid fragment, and you, you think this is really well reduced, and you put the second screw in, and why is it not so well reduced? It's because you push the fragment apart, and the whole lunate fragment is able to rotate around that one screw that you put in. And I don't really have a solution to that other than to redesign the plate, I think. Yeah. So some of the Americans use a four millimeter screw with a washer in, in that area. So you take, uh, um, you essentially put a screw across in the center of that lunate fragment to the washer and push it through. But it's, it, it looks huge on x -ray. I've never mm. done that before. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, we, we've still got, we're still going strong in terms of, of audience. So um, I am going to um, share a, a few more cases. Um, so here we go, 79 year old dermatologist. Um, and this is the, the image here. Who wants to take this? Uh, Sumed? Yeah, I mean, so, Looking at the bone quality, I mean, it's clearly a, a shattered, almost dusted um, distal radius. Uh, and I'll probably ignore the ulna for the moment. And um, um, one of the things we do with fractures like this is to do a manip intraoperatively. I, I'm not, I won't necessarily do a, a CT scan perhaps in, the, in this case, but following a manip under a C arm it gives you a little bit more of an idea. So do you have any post manipulation views, um, Zaf? There we go. So it still looks, um, it still looks pretty dusted in terms of its ability to. I think that you, you, you mentioned Sumed quite importantly, the, the concept of carpal alignment um, and yeah. Uh, focusing on the lunate and, and the capitate in terms of the, the lineup. Yeah. You know, just, just in terms of the importance of that, yeah. um, you know, the carpal escape. I mean, you, you know, if you were looking at this as a, so, so as a, as a, when, when I, when I, when I, when I started training, I would, you know, I would be quick to correct as a, as a junior registrar, correct the SHO. We would talk it about a wrist fracture and say, no, 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 this is not a wrist fracture. It's a distal radius fracture. But the more, the more, the more I think about it actually, we, we perhaps should think about distal radius fractures, not as distal radius fractures, but, but actually consider it as a joint problem, not a single bone problem to yeah. enable us to focus on the DRUJ, the ulna and the carpus. Yeah. And, and, and the more I think about it, actually wrist fracture is probably the right, the right way of thinking as long, so we consider everything. In this situation, on the lateral, the radius, you, you, know, you may think, oh, well, um, it, it kind of looks like a radius, uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of it gone distally, but, but the carpus is telling its own story here, isn't it? It is, yeah. So, I mean, from, from my point of view, I think probably parts of that wrist don't look reconstructable. One option would be perhaps to get a CT to get more info at this stage. Um, and then depending upon those findings, decide whether you want to, whether, whether it's reconstructable at all. Um, and consider something like, um, I don't really do too many X fixes, but uh, if the bone quality is not great, the lunate fossa is not reconstructable and there's significant crush you know, of the carpus bone, maybe think of a, a, something like a, you know, what I spoke about earlier, a joint spanning plate. Yeah, yeah. so just on that, um, Lindsay, so X fixes, I, don't, I can't remember the last time I put an X fix on versus a spanning plate. Uh, X fixes were uh, um, quite uh, commonly used, e e bridging and non-bridging, particularly north of the border, Lindsay. Um, what what are the advantages of using a spanning plate versus why not? Why not? Um, what are the risks of an X fix versus a spanning? I think one of the problems that arose from X fix that I, I realized was that um, you put the X fix on and it doesn't reduce the fracture. So then what you do is you jack the X fix out. And if you look at some of the post-op films from some years ago, you see that the joint is a sort of centimeter open gap between in the radiocarpal and the midcarpal joint. And then, uh, but then the fracture was reduced, but then by the time the fracture all healed up, they couldn't move their fingers anymore because you'd wrecked the soft tissues. And so I realized that if you're going to do X-Fix, I think it's really important at the end, put your X-Fix on and make sure you can flex the fingers fully. Because if you can't, it's too tight and you have a great wrist and a terrible hand. Uh, and I guess they're more prone to infection and the, uh, the buried plate, the spanning plate 
gives you some push down. It makes it easier to get the x-rays and you can leave it in for a longer period. But effectively, they are doing the same thing, aren't they? They are spanning across the wrist. Hmm. So here we go. Um, Lisa, do you want to um, talk us through this? Um, well, I think uh, Sumed pretty much covered it. I mean, um, the carpus wasn't aligned with the radius and the it is un unreconstructable. I don't, I don't think um, you're going to get any screws in any of that. So this is the best option, I think, uh, for, a, you know, it's, it's out to length. You haven't had to do anything to the ulna. Um, and actually, we usually take the, I don't know what you do, uh, Sumer, but we usually take these out after about three months and just to see if they can get a jot of movement afterwards. But at least if you need to do something like a fusion or a wrist replacement, possibly you would have something that was lined up vaguely. Um, so I think she did quite well. I can't so remember. I'm, I'm interested you touched there, there on, on wrist replacement, Lisa. Has anybody any experience of a hemiarthroplasty for distal radial fracture like, like this? We haven't. Okay. Yeah, you could you could do it potentially, I guess. I mean, we haven't we haven't done it um, so far, but um, I know that I know they're out there and they exist. We've tended to fix. I mean, this is I mean, maybe twice I've done that twice in 16 years. And I'm you know, so I don't think you use it very often, but just occasionally you, you really look hard at it and go, do you know what? No, that is not doable. So. But I, I know Mike's done a couple of hemis in, in, in this sort of situation. So mm. they tend to do reasonably well. But, you know, you're literally looking at 70 plus that sort of age group. I really wouldn't do this in younger people, regardless of what the, the literature says. So it's really important that th these people are not in any meaningful employment and that they're not in any major physical jobs uh, and that they don't have any physical hobbies and that they're aware that this may be a staging procedure to a formal, possibly a, a difficult fusion. So as long as you've got those three things in place, um, you could probably do a hemi. Technically, relatively easy to do. But I find that after you take the plate out, Zaf, um, most of these people don't need any more procedures. I mean, mm. how many of these span plates have you gone in to fuse? None. Mm. So mm -hmm. that's another interesting observation. Yeah. We've, we've had a fantastic audience that's, that's kept with us um, throughout this. I'm going to finish with one last case and then hopefully wrap up at the end of that because um, people have gone the distance with us. So um, here, here's, here's the final case I'm going to share with you. Um, so 21-year-old, right-handed, fit and well, doesn't really call smoke, assault with a samurai sword um, and transferred from another hospital with no other injuries. So this is the initial x-ray, samurai sword injury. Who, Lindsay, uh, do you want to, <laughs> being, in, being in, the, in the level one trauma center? Just, just a bit of fun. Typical, <laughs> typical, typical Salford uh, situation. Salford injury, yes, we see it on a regular basis. Um, well, is there, are there any other views or is it just that one view or is that all I need? Well, I was just thinking if you could help us with what you can see there and then we can... Okay, well, it, it looks to me like this. he's put his hand up and he's uh, had a nice neat incision between the capitate and the hamate and then a nice clean bisection of the, uh, of the lunate and carrying on down into the radius. Yeah. So I guess there's some soft tissue reconstruction required in the hand uh, and intermetacarpal ligaments. The radius fracture on the basis of that doesn't look too scary. Um, I'd need to have a bit of a think about what to do for the lunate for the base, but perhaps putting a, um, well, actually perhaps just winding across the lunate from either side from scaphoid into lunate, just to and try and compress it and then wire across to stabilize it, because putting a screw across it is probably not a compression screw, which might seem like a good idea. It's probably not that easy to do, uh, and then um, and then the radius fix that on its merits, which is probably, um, I, I, if it's just a nice clean cut like that, you might get away with just some compression screws if you could get them to fit in the correct yeah. direction. Yeah. So, so Sumed, I mean, probably not your typical uh, case in leafy oh. writington. No. No, um, uh, no I, I mean, I'm, I'm completely nonplussed. It's not a pattern that I've seen. And um, certainly you just have to, Treat it, you know, it's one of those bespoke approach that approaches like what yeah. Lindsay's described, really. Yeah. So here we go. Here's the picture, Sumed. It's not not uh, not a pretty not, picture. Uh, not 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 for the elective list tomorrow. 
No, definitely. <laughs> so, um, so here we go. So, so this is um, this is what was done. Um, Lisa. Uh, yeah, this was an entertaining day. Um, so it was uh, it was quite hard work, but I think we were quite pleased with what we got in the end. Uh, you're absolutely right, Lindsay. It was a bugger to fix that lunate, but. Um, uh, they they come from Ukraine with K wires everywhere. The whole thing had just been K wired, um, and so we just took all the K wires out. Um, it was quite difficult to get the fracture fragments to um, align uh, on the lunate, but then we got two cross screws and that held it quite well. And this is a bit later on actually when the radius is healed and the lunate was there was a really there was a wide gap in the lunate to start with, and I thought oh he's going to get AVN, um, but actually it has started to heal. I mean he's a really fit. Uh, young lad I mean when it was referred to me I thought oh this is going to be a ne'er-do-well what's he been doing in Ukraine but he arrived and he's a really healthy fit doesn't smoke doesn't drink really fit lad and uh, so we did we did our best to try and sort it out for him he'd sort of come through the head of the metacarpal and down in between the um, capitate and the hamate so there's a little flake off that so we put a screw across there as well but I just put that on as a bit a bit to make you think at the end no, Not what every day yeah and, and the in terms of the fracture pattern for the radius, coming back to the radius, you you've just gone across. Um, you've treated it on first principles. There's a split fracture, and you've gone across with two. Well, two, yeah, two I, exactly. I was get, I was getting the plate out and doing all this, and the registrar was with me, and they go, "Do you know what? You could just put a couple of screws across that." And I was going, "Do you know what?" And so they got the the poor hand team. I think they were despairing of me by the end. So I said, "Oh, could you?" Could you get me the small fragment screw set out as well, please? So, uh, so they uh, they they got all that. So we had all the little handsets and the anchors and uh, some Aki tracks and all sorts. It was a real um, anything you can think of um, day. And the plastics came and gave us a help, so that I didn't have to do all the plastic soft tissue stuff as well. So it was quite nice to share it out between the two of us. Um, he did quite. He really been lucky. So he the, it obviously finished just next to the median nerve. So he divided his, obviously the deep branch of the ulnar nerve had gone, so we repaired that. Um, but he'd, and he'd done, he'd got segmental sectioning of um, the, one of the digital nerves for the ring finger um, and um, uh, the common digital nerve as well to the fourth rep. But it, actually considering he, and he got segmental loss of one of the tendons that we had to sort of cobble together. Anyway, he's quite stiff. He's down for a tenolysis, but um, he bought me a nice bottle of champagne. I'm sure, um, I mean, you know, once you did all the fancy bone work, there's just a little bit of soft tissue work. Tidying it up, really, that was, yeah. It, yeah. It, was a bit of plastic. Plastic. it was good a of them to help. A bit of plastic aesthetic work at the end there. Yeah. Fantastic. yeah. So great case to end. Um, I'm going to try and summarise, if that is even possible, about what we learned tonight. Um, uh, Sumit gave an excellent talk on, on the literature and how there's been so much literature, but there's still real questions that we need to ask ourselves in terms of how that literature guides us. Um, little, little bits I, you know, I picked up that for, for us to remember, you know, the radi radiological outcomes do not correlate with functional outcomes, and that's something important for us to consider. Um, um, Sumed also mentioned about the need and importance to assess the DRUJ on the table, something that came out both with, with, with Lindsay and, and, and Lisa's talks as well in terms of from a medical legal perspective, from a top tip perspective, once you've done your distal radius fixation, do assess the DIUJ and be pedantic about it and make that part of your routine and document what that, DIU, you, you, that, what that DIUJ is doing. Uh, and that will help guide really what you do with the ulna as well. Um, Sumit mentioned the blue book, which uh, is recommended reading. I think all the trainees, you should, you should access that and you can get that on the BSSH website. Um, uh, and then ultimately in his final slide, um, despite all the literature we have, that we need to have probably a, a bespoke approach, which all of us probably do, but we maybe don't openly admit it. We do have a bespoke approach, um, taking into uh, account the patient factors and the surgeon factors. Uh, Lindsay uh, was, um, spoke to us really about the importance of the medical legal aspect and how uh, just because you're following certain guidelines, is not going to necessarily save you from litigation. And, and, and the converse is that you don't have to follow the guidelines um, um, and, and um, that isn't being negligent if you don't follow the guidelines. And that kind of feeds in also to the, um, the bespoke approach that most of us will have. Consent's really important. And particularly if you're working in a team, 
uh, consider uh, having an open-ended consent in terms of the different things that can be offered to a patient when you're when you're working in an environment where uh, this patient may end up on different lists, your patient may end up on a diff different surgeon's lists. And of course, Montgomery, what Montgomery shows us is that it's not good enough just to offer a, an ORIF to everybody. Um, and, and you do have to go through um, all the different options available, which is a killer um, if you're the registrar on call in, in A&E they're doing a consent, that, 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 that is a reality. Lindsay also picked up on um, the screw penetration, as did Lisa, and, and the importance of certain radiological imaging at the end of your operation. So there is something called a skyline view, which um, Lindsay mentioned, and, and, and there's also the, uh, the elevated lateral view at 20 degrees to take out that radial um, inclination, uh, and that will help you work out whether the screws are in the joint or not. Um, or, or penetrating um, out, out the back. Um, uh, Lisa, 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 taught, Lisa gave us many, many tips in terms of uh, operatively. And one of the things she said that she, she avoids KYs now in elderly uh, patients. So it's either a full on fixation or a plaster. And that kind of alludes to the fact that um, KYs and soft bone is, is, is probably not um, gonna work. And also you're repeatedly bringing in elderly patients. Uh, and so, um, many hand surgeons, uh, as, as they get more and more senior, will actually do something which you may think is counterintuitive, and that is you're fixing more uh, elderly patients with, with, with plates than, than, than actually using a plaster because of all these other patient factors, dragging patients back uh, seven or eight times, and then, you know, um, the, that resource drain that, that Sumed uh, mentioned as well. Look for the ulnar variants, assess the DRUJ, um, uh, uh, as, as mentioned before, and take your time at the end with, with imaging. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you um, to, to Sumed and, and thank you to Lisa and Lindsay. Thank you to all our audience who've stayed up uh, quite late. This is all going to be on YouTube um, recorded anyway, so you can uh, scroll back at your leisure. Uh, and good luck to all of you who are in training uh, with um, your forthcoming exams, etc. And that's then good night from me and uh, on behalf of all the hub.